Well, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, glad to see I'm such a hit. You know, I came here all the way from New York just to be here tonight. That's the truth. You can imagine what a sensation I am there. If I had to come here to make a living. <laughs> so I never even knew that I would be a comedian. It's hard to believe, but this never appealed to me as a way of life. And I never thought it would be necessary altogether because my father himself was once a big businessman. Unfortunately, he was ruined in the crash. Some big stockbroker jumped out of a window and fell on his pushcart. <laughs> and he was almost wiped out. And so my father came to me with a vicious suggestion. He said, go to work. <laughs> How can I work? I got no time. I found out one thing about work. It takes a whole day. I'm not going to give up a whole day just to go to work. I've got things to do. What do you think? I'm not busy. Like right now, I'm looking for a job. I'm not going to give that up just to go to work. At least this I know I got. Why should I give up something definite? For something I don't know. Well, well. <laughs> not only that, I'll tell you the truth. I would like to work. Unfortunately, I'm not ashamed to tell you. All my life, I've had trouble with my back. I can't get it off the bed. <laughs> I hope you realize and appreciate the significance of the fact that I keep a show clean. I don't know if you notice it. I don't tell dirty jokes. I don't know if you heard about it, but that's the truth. I never tell dirty jokes under any circumstances. Because as a matter of fact, when my family first came to this country many years ago from Italy. <laughs> don't ask me what they were doing in Italy. I don't know. <laughs> they must have been on their way from Israel. I don't know. <laughs> I have to talk like this purposely. I'm the only Italian that talks like this. <laughs> Most of the other Italians don't know how to talk. I have to teach them how to talk English. This is the right way to talk. You don't hear about it. You know that I happen to come from a family that's the original settlers in this country? My family settled in West Virginia 300 years ago. And to this day, they all talk like this. You don't know that this is the right way to talk. You talk with an accent. This is the right way. <laughs> You know that this whole country, this whole concept of democracy that we live under today actually started with my family. They are responsible for making this country what it is. I have a great grandfather who happens to be the original signer of the Declaration of Independence. And it wasn't easy for him to sign it. Because he was living in Poland at the time. But he took one look, he liked it, signed right away. I'll tell you another thing that my family accomplished. Did you ever hear of General Custard with his last stand? Do you know that my uncle had a stand right next to Costa? <laughs> but he didn't bother with Costa, he sold pizza pie. He knew that from Costa, you cannot make a living to me. I don't like to show off too much about my family, I just want to ask you one question. Did you ever hear of the Boston Tea Party? Who do you think was the caterer? <laughs> that was also my family. The wrong people always get credit for the inventions in this country. I want to show you an example. Everybody talks about Benjamin Franklin with the invention of electricity. Never would have thought of it if not for my uncle. Do you know about that? My uncle gave him the whole idea. He came to my uncle bleeding for money. My uncle took one look at him and he said, go fly a kite. <laughs> Actually, for some people, I'm ahead of my time. I have the same trouble that Marconi had. Are you last meal? How do I compare myself to Marconi? Great men have the same thing in common. During their own lifetime, nobody knows what they're talking about. <laughs> Hundreds of years later, they first discovered that Marconi was a great man. During his own lifetime, when he invented the radio tube, nobody believed in it. Did you know that? His own wife didn't even believe it. She said to him, so what, the radio tube? Who needs it? <laughs> and she said, if you're such a genius, why can't you fix the television set? <laughs> she couldn't figure it out. <laughs> Actually, actually, I'm not disturbed whether people like me or not because the truly successful man is the man who's happy within himself. Did you know that? Why am I this blessed with this quality? I'll explain it to you. Because I am a happy man. I have found the secret of happiness. Very few people know how to be happy. That's why so many books are being written on the subject today. Every time you pick up a book today, it tells you how to be happy. You notice it? I saw a book last week entitled How to Be Happy Without Money. This book cost $15. <laughs> Goes to show you, if you got no money, you can't even find out how to be happy. Without money. If you could find happiness from books, people wouldn't chase girls. <laughs> Why do people chase girls? For the same reason that other people climb mountains. Did you ever see some people actually climb mountains to find happiness? Psychologists figured this out. They say that people climb mountains for the same reason that other people chase girls. 
Not necessarily they want the girl, they want to conquer something. It's a sickness. That's why people climb mountains. They need the mountain. <laughs> Maybe they do. I don't know how sick you can get. <laughs> but it's not really the mountain. It's the need for conquest. That's what psychologists figure out. When they conquer that mountain, they feel happy. Now, if you conquer a girl, I can see it. Might give you something to do. <laughs> but what are you going to do with a conquered mountain? <laughs> I mean, once you put the flag in, there's no place to go. Uh, You can't take a mountain any place, and even if you could, who wants it in the house? <laughs> I want to say in all sincerity, it was a pleasure, but that's it. All good things come to an end. But since this isn't such a good thing, <laughs> I'll spend a few more minutes. I'll see if it gets better. Otherwise, I'll get out of here because I'll tell you very sincerely, I don't need this. Thank God. <laughs> this is not going to help me pay my income tax either. I don't want to pay my income tax anyway. I'll tell you the truth, I resent this country even asking me for money. They got a lot of money asking me for money. I don't use nothing up in this country. I don't go any place, I don't buy nothing. And what I buy, I pay for. So why should I give them money for nothing? For years I was starving, I couldn't make a living. You think they sent me money for nothing? Never. They never sent me, they didn't even sent me a card. They asked me, maybe I need a couple of dollars. Do they know if I needed money or not? They didn't even care. All of a sudden, they found out I'm making money. They became my partner. <laughs> I wouldn't mind if they asked me once. Once I could understand. This is going on for years already. I told them I gave her. Here's somebody else. I can't support you all my life, I told them. Sooner or later, you have to learn to stand on your own two feet. I'm not going to be here forever. What are you going to do when I'm gone? Close up the country? I wouldn't mind if it was a poor country asking me for money. This is the richest country in the history of the world. How does it look they come to me, Phil? Ridiculous. You know what the budget was from this country last year? $187 billion. You know what I gave them? $12. Without my $12, they couldn't get along. I told them if I spend $187 billion, then if you're $12, sure, I'll help you. If a poor country asked me for money, I'd be glad to help them. Afghanistan. They want money, I'll be the first one. Their whole budget last year was six dollars. I give them twelve, they got enough for two years. But this country don't need me. <laughs> and they didn't disturb me when Eisenhower asked for money or Truman. Poor people. They never made a comfortable living. They needed money, I could understand it. But Kennedy, he needs my money. What do you think? <laughs> it's hard for me to believe that he can't make a living without me. It's a young guy, I trust him. Go to work. You don't want to work? <laughs> Let him send his brother. One out of two is not bad. <laughs> I don't know if you realize what a great man Kennedy is. Anybody who can go to Paris, France, be there alone for two months, and come back to his wife and claim to her that he got trouble with his back from chopping feet. <laughs> this must really be a genius. Ridiculous. This whole country, depending on me for a living. I could never figure it out. First of all, who could afford to support him in the style that he went to live? You see the car he bought last year for my money? A $12,000 car. How does he know I want to buy him such a fancy car? <laughs> a special car made to order with an open top so he could stand up. Wants to stand up, he don't need a car, let him take a horse. <laughs> <laughs> the week before that, I really resented it. He came to the Waldorf Astoria to eat lunch for my money. Went from Washington to the Waldorf Astoria for lunch. <laughs> let him eat in the Howard Johnson. <laughs> I eat in the Howard Johnson, I pay my own money, I have to send him to the Wall of Astoria, and he brought 300 people with him, the other 300 people I don't even know. <laughs> I'm buying them lunch, let him show me the guest list, how does he know I want to invite those people? <laughs> I got a bill for that lunch, $15,000. My bar mitzvah didn't cost that money. <laughs> There's certain things that he needs, I would be glad to buy him. I would be glad to pay for a haircut. If he wants a haircut, I would be the first one to pay for it. He needs it. My president walks around with hair in his eyes. I can't stand that. I'd like him to see what he did. You know who he invited for my money to the White House a couple of weeks ago? NASA from Egypt. I paid for his vacation in my White House. Would he invite me to his house? Ben Gurion, if he wants to invite, I'll be glad to pay. If you stop to think how you spend your money for income tax, they take it and spend it on things that you don't even need. You know about that? A half a billion dollars, of which twelve dollars was mine last year, went to build roads. I haven't got a car. I told them, buy me a car, build your road. 
And the road that they're building is not even in my neighborhood. I can't even use that road. <laughs> I couldn't get to that road even if I had a car because from my house to that road, there's no road. <laughs> <laughs> Another half a billion dollars of my money went last year for a school lunch program. School lunch program, I paid for it. I ate already. <laughs> and even if I didn't eat them, I'm going to go to a school to eat lunch. How is it going to look? <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, I said to myself, I ought to get a little return on my investment. I went into one of the schools, I sat down, I said, all right, I'll eat lunch. As long as I'm paying for it anyway. They threw me out. They said I was too old. At what age are you too old to eat lunch? I said, can I have a breakfast at least? I'm paying anyway. Can I get something? <laughs> Do you know that $2 billion of my money went last year for police protection? They take money to protect the police. <laughs> I told them, let them protect themselves. They got guns. <laughs> Besides, I got a brother that's a crook. He depends on me for a living. Why should I wipe out my brother to help them? What bothers me more than everything is that I spent last year my money to fight fires. This is the stupidest thing in the world. Could you fight fires with money? Water, I told him. <laughs> I told him, I'll send you 50 gallons of water, stop bothering me for money. They don't listen to me, they took my money, they put it in the bank, the bank went down. <laughs> you know that right now, the threat of overpopulation, it threatens to overwhelm all those people who are already here. There's not enough food being produced to feed the people who are coming into this world. Overpopulation, according to the Malthusian theory, is one of the great threats of the world today. Did you know that? Do you know that as I'm talking to you right now, in China, there's more children born every minute than in India? And in India, there's more children born every minute than in Turkey. Which proves only one thing, that more people talk Turkey in India <laughs> than in Turkey. You see, sociologists have been studying this problem very carefully. And sociologists have found out an amazing thing that in most cases, children are hereditary. <laughs> In other words, if your parents never had children, the chances are that you won't have any children either. You need great thinkers to figure that out. You think this is easy? <laughs> you got that? They found out another thing that I can't get over. A sociologist from Columbia University, a whole team as a matter of fact, went from Columbia University, they went to India to find out what's causing all these children. Because they couldn't figure it out. After all, why should they have more children than us? After all, we got whatever they got. We don't. So this team went to India to find out what's causing it. Now this team got lost. So they sent another team to look for that team. They lost already 7,000 teams in India. And you know what they found out? That these teams are causing all the children. <laughs> Although they found out there's one town right here in West Virginia where children are being born even more than in India. It was in the papers only last week. I don't know if you heard about it. Right now in West Virginia, it's because of the railroad. Now you'll ask me a good question. How does a railroad cause children? I'm glad you asked. You see, the railroad passes every morning in this town at 6.30 and wakes everybody up. At that hour, it's too early to go to work and it's too late to go back to sleep. Oh, you know it, it's all over the place. Well, what else are you going to do 6.30? There's nothing on television. Well, I don't want to get involved in this whole subject. This is really none of my business. I told you before, I don't tell off-color jokes. Slightly, but not a lot. Because it's not nice. After all, anybody can tell off-color jokes and be a hit. The trick is to be clean and be funny. This is the trick. This trick, I don't know. I got other tricks. I can't know every trick. I started out by telling you, but it's true that according to my religion, it's a sin to tell a dirty joke. That's why a real dirty joke you'll never hear from me. It's a sin to tell a dirty joke according to my religion. As a matter of fact, it's the same sin as the sin of eating bread on Peso. Did you know that? I made it up. <laughs> I made that up, but I'll tell you something which is true. Did you know that according to my religion, and no matter what your denomination is, I wish you would listen to this very carefully because you could learn great moral concepts of life from every religion in the world. In that respect, they're all the same in terms of morality. If you realize this and appreciate the significance of this, this will teach you a great lesson in life. Do you know that according to my religion, the sin of eating bread on Passover is comparable to the sin of adultery? Adultery and bread on Passover are comparable to each other, remember that. Although I told this to a friend of mine and he told me that he tried them both. And he can't see the comparison. <laughs> Uh, 
thanks a lot. And now... Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to leave you with the words of a great man, Frank Sinatra. It's a guy who runs around with girls all hours of the night, became a celebrity. Let's be honest about it, there's just a way to live. Do you think that he's happy? Huh? <laughs> Looks like you do. You might think that he's happy. I got news for you. I found out that he also thinks that he's happy. But you know something? I know this man. I found out that deep in his heart, he's very happy. <laughs> But psychologists say that he isn't. Do you know that? Psychologists say that he's suffering terribly, but he doesn't know it. They know it, but he doesn't. <laughs> Meanwhile, he runs around from one girl to the other, suffering like anything. <laughs> they can't even get them to tell him about it. Is he gonna stop suffering to listen to them? <laughs> they say he's suffering because basically he doesn't know what he wants. That's the main reason. He doesn't know. I know. I don't know where to get it. Well, I know what he wants. <laughs> Whatever it is that he wants is a pathetic thing. Because there really is no reason. A healthy person doesn't have to chase thousands of girls. Do you know that? Because after all, what's the difference between one girl and another? Huh? <laughs> you don't know either. <laughs> girls are all the same. That's the truth. It's only in the mind of a man who has to prove his masculinity by the conquest of women. Because after all, what does a man want from a woman in the first place? Huh? <laughs> Or even in the second place. What is he, he wants what he couldn't get in the first place. That's why he went to the second place. Otherwise he would stay in one place. <laughs> Looks like you lost my place. <laughs> the normal man only wants one thing from a woman. Companionship. I'm talking about a very old man. <laughs> you didn't know that this was a sickness, did you? You know that doctors have discovered that it is a sickness. They have a new attitude about sex. They have discovered that sex is bad for one. For two, great. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like you all agree with me. Well, the truth of the matter is that whether it's good or bad is not really the question. The question is really a moral question. Let's be honest about it. You could have a good time, there's no doubt about it, if you let yourself foot loose and fancy free and run around with every girl you meet. And the kind of people that have these good times, nevertheless, are only enjoying themselves for the moment. They're not thinking in terms of their future or in terms of the better life, the essential better life. They want to have a good time for the minute. But even this is a fraud and a fallacy because they enjoy themselves only for the minute. Did you know that? You take any playboy, you'll notice that by the time he's 35 or 40 or 45, not more than 50. <laughs> All right, 55. The most 60. Would you settle for 65? By that time, he's tired. That's from running around. That's why I don't run around. And do you know something? I don't run around and I might sacrifice momentary pleasures. But it's hard for you to believe that in the long run, I'm better off than Frank Sinatra. I never knew it either. But a psychologist explained it to me. He proved it to me this way, and it makes a lot of sense. He said to me, Frank Sinatra, with all his girls, how long do you think he could go on this way? I said to him, I'll ask you a better question. How long do you think that I could go on this way? <laughs> do you know that I'd rather go two weeks that way than a hundred years this way? <laughs> uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's still not it. I don't like to make jokes about money. Unfortunately, people get the wrong impression. As far as money is concerned, let's be honest about it. To assume that it's insignificant is preposterous. But to make it the most important thing in life is even more ridiculous. Money is important, but it's not as important as love. The most important thing in life is not money, it's love. Personally, I'm very fortunate because I love money. <laughs> Do you know what I found out? I found out that there's only one thing you could get without money. Sick. You want to get better, it costs a fortune. Because doctors want nothing but money. But I say don't allow it to pervert your standard of values. Remember this, live a life of brotherhood, honor, and fraternity. And you'll see that in the long run, you'll be wiped out completely. <laughs> Above everything, ladies and gentlemen, take my advice, do unto others, and do it fast. Otherwise, they'll do it to you. No, I hope you realize that that's a joke. You can make a joke out of anything. Above everything, I've always believed this. Love your fellow man. 
I tried it last night. The guy called me names. <laughs> I want to say in all sincerity, this is very important to remember. I don't know if you got time to memorize it. <laughs> but if you got time, I wish you would remember this. Find out who you are. Most people never find out who they are. There was a time that even I didn't know who I was. It's hard to believe. Luckily, my psychiatrist told me who I am. <laughs> Not for him to this day, I wouldn't know who I am. That happens to sound like a joke, but it's the truth. As soon as I came into his office, the first thing he said to me is, we're going to have to find out who the real you is. Otherwise, you'll never be happy. I couldn't figure it out at the time. I said to myself, I need him to find out who I am. If I don't know who I am, how is he going to know? He never met me. He said, we both don't know. That's why we have to look for the real you. I said to myself, if I don't know who I am, how will I know who to look for? And even if I find me, how will I know if it's me? Besides, if I want to look for me, what do I need him? I can look myself. Or I can take my friends. We know where I was. <laughs> we'll know where to look. <laughs> Besides, I said to myself, what if I find the real me and I find that he's even worse than me? What do I need him? I don't make enough for myself. I need a partner. <laughs> Ten years ago, I've been glad to look for anybody, but now I'm doing good. Why should I look for him? Let him look for me. <laughs> he said, the search for the real you will have to continue. That will be $25, please. I said to myself, this is not the real me. Why should I give him the $25? <laughs> I'll look for the real me. Let him give him the $25. What if I find the real me and he doesn't think it's worth 25 dollars? Then I'm stuck my money with the real him? <laughs> I said to myself, for all I know, the real me might be going to a different psychiatrist over here. I'd even be a psychiatrist himself. I said, wouldn't it be funny if you're the real me and you owe me 25 dollars? I said, I'll tell you what, I'll charge you 10 dollars, we'll call it even. <laughs> I just want to leave you with the words of a great man, Dr. Kinsey. Dr. Kinsey, you once said to the sex maniac. He said, you're okay in my book. <laughs> Do you know that the average married man in this country today can't be trusted, according to Dr. Kinsey? You don't know that. Two out of four men, two out of four men in this country right now, according to Dr. Kinsey. <laughs> Did you know that? I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out another thing. I said to myself, he's such a genius. Why do you have to say two out of four? Could have said one out of two, same thing. <laughs> Goes to show you, he knew a lot about sex, but arithmetic, <laughs> this he didn't know too much about. He also said that women in this country can't be trusted either. I'm ashamed to tell you that among women in this country right now, one out of three, according to Dr. Kinsey, Same thing like the men. One out of three, ever since I read that, whenever I see three girls together, I always wonder, which is the world? <laughs> Just my luck, all my life, I'm meeting the wrong two. <laughs> now I know every place you go, you see two girls together. You know why? Because the third one is in a room somewhere. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, that's close. <laughs> but it's not it yet. May I just take this opportunity from the bottom of my heart. I would really like to wish myself the best of luck. <laughs> Let's hope that God should bless me and keep me because from this business I'll never make a living. <laughs> I sincerely hope that I should have whatever I want. And whatever you want, I should also have. <laughs> In case you want things that I've never heard of, why should I be left out? <laughs> I want to leave you with the words of a great man, Montezuma. Montezuma, who once said, Tell those Marines to stop singing in the hallways. <laughs> Thank you, Angel.